Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to be welcoming you all to Virginia Tech's annual Civil War Weekend. My name is Paul Quigley. I'm director of the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. And the center has been sponsoring this event since back in 1991. Every single year we've held Civil War Weekend at Virginia Tech with only one exception. And I know you all can guess which the exception was. It was last year, 2020. Of course, we had to cancel the event due to the COVID pandemic in its early days back then. Uh, it's hard to believe we're still in the same mode a year later. So usually we meet for a really enjoyable in-person weekend on the campus of Virginia Tech at the Campus Hotel. Um, we listen to speakers, we enjoy conversation, good food, camaraderie. And so I'm really missing all that this year and missing the opportunity to see old friends. But one of the silver linings, of course, of the shift online is that we attract new audiences. We get people who have not been to Civil War Weekend before uh, from all over the country. So whether you're a longtime attendee who's been coming for years or whether this is your first time with us, you are very, very welcome and I hope you'll continue. I hope this will become a new tradition for the new attendees and you'll join us in person next year. Well, this period that we're in right now, even without the pandemic, would have been a time of transition and difficulty, honestly, for Civil War Weekend and, and the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies, because in November 2019, most of you know this, we lost our founding director, the person who started the center, Civil War Weekend, Dr. James I. Bud Robertson, Jr. Uh, who was just a legendary Civil War historian, a beloved Virginia Tech professor for 44 years altogether. And he has left uh, just an unfillable hole really in the world of Civil War history and in the community of Virginia Tech as well. So one of the really sad things about having to cancel last year's event was having to cancel what was supposed to be a tribute to Dr. Budd, as he was affectionately known by generations of Virginia Tech students. So we had to cancel last year. And this year, when it became apparent that we would be online rather than in person, I decided that we just couldn't do the tribute in the right way in this kind of format online via Zoom. It just wasn't going to be possible to honor Dr. Robertson's legacy in this kind of format. So uh, sad as it is, we have postponed the tribute to Dr. Bud until next year, and we will meet in person then, March 25th through 27th, 2022. We'll be back at the Inn at Virginia Tech. We'll be gathering in person to remember and honor the legacy of this really extraordinary figure, again, in both Civil War history as a field, but also in the community of Virginia Tech. So this year, we're going to meet three times, as you know, uh, each of the next three Thursdays, we'll get together, same time, same place. You do have to register separately for each event, by the way. Um, but each week, we're going to hear from three different speakers. And every speaker uh, over the next three weeks is going to address in one way or another the same theme, which is resources for war. And I think you'll agree once we get into these talks with me that the speakers have just done a terrific job coming up with creative, just really interesting ways of interpreting that topic, resources for war, what did Americans need, what did they use in order to wage war against each other. So we're going to be hearing about everything from manpower to clothing to bullets, to the intangible resources like information for one example and love for another. So just really imaginative approaches to that theme of resources for war. And it was my job, one of my jobs to split these nine talks into three different sessions, one for each week. And the theme, the kind of sub theme I came up with uh, for this week is um, manpower and horsepower, which sounds kind of weird. That was the best way uh, I could come up with to separate these topics out. Um, but you're going to hear three really excellent talks on that theme tonight. Uh, each speaker is going to speak for about 15 minutes, so fairly short presentations, and that's going to leave us plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. And you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time throughout the evening, and uh, we will respond to those later after all three talks have taken place.
So we're looking forward to hearing your questions and feedback very much. That's part of the excitement for us going into this evening. Our first speaker tonight is going to be Dr. Caroline Wood Newhall, and she's very well known around here because she works as the postdoctoral fellow at the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies here at Virginia Tech. Before that, she earned her PhD at UNC Chapel Hill. She's working on a book about Black POW experiences in the Confederacy. And by the way, she gave a terrific talk on that topic last fall, soon after she arrived in Blacksburg, which is now available at the YouTube channel for the Virginia Center for Civil War Studies. You should be able to find that easily enough and is also on the, the C-SPAN website. It was broadcast on C-SPAN 3 shortly after she delivered it. So uh, tonight her topic is Interest Convergence, the U.S. Effort to Recruit Black Soldiers. Thank you, Dr. Newhall. Thank you so much, Paul. I appreciate the introduction. And I want to say thank you so much to Leland and Caroline Honeycutt, uh, Leland Shelton and Her Caroline Honeycutt from the uh, Continuing and Professional Education Center. They've been doing so much work on this. So thank you. <laughs> this has been so smooth. And I don't know if it would have been without you. So we appreciate that. Um, so yes, thank you so much. So I'll just jump right into it. Don't have too much time and I, I don't want to hold you on too long and cut into the other panelists. Uh, so long story short, my research uh, really centers on ideas and applications of how legal conditions created by warfare created circumstances that people could take advantage of that might not have been previously available to them, primarily through looking at Black prisoners of war who fought for the Union were captured by the Confederacy. And so tonight what I'm looking at is the idea of interest convergence and how recruitment among uh, Black Americans, particularly in the South, particularly enslaved Black Americans, Black men in particular, uh, led to these kind of initially positive results such as emancipation, uh, but had some significant limitations when it came to achieving equality. But the ways I'm going to talk about this center on how Black Americans were able to find common ground with the United States as a national entity and, and take advantage of that and push the United States to meet them partway at the very least and, and make some civil rights gains. Whereas the Confederacy largely failed to do this. Uh, had the Confederacy made efforts to the degree that the United States had, we might be experiencing a different story. And then centering on how Black Americans in the South, especially formerly enslaved people, managed to use the war to affect their freedom, essentially. So I will share my screen now. Uh, apologies for <laughs> this whole setup. All right, there we go. So uh, interest convergence, the US effort to recruit black soldiers. And I wanna open up with this idea of what interest convergence is. Now interest convergence is a particular topic that comes through in critical race theory, which has come out of this idea of legal realism. A lot of legal scholars, historians, numerous people have undertaken this work led by uh, Professor Derek Bell in trying to understand how racism and uh, the law coincide in the United States and the ways in which the law can achieve certain things but also runs into limitations when it comes to affecting equality um, and, and achieving ideals versus what happens in reality. So when I'm talking about interest convergence, I'm using it in a specific context that might not necessarily be as familiar to people who might know about interest convergence and critical race theory. Uh, essentially, the idea behind interest convergence is that there are times where civil rights gains for communities of color coincide with the dictates of white self-interest, meaning that the ruling classes, the ruling powers, those who pass laws, who are part of the legislature, the executive, which historically in the United States has been predominantly white people, uh, how people of color have managed to intersect with the interests of, of the ruling class, essentially, to make some gains, but also how those gains have particular limitations. And the way in which Professor Bell has talked about this, and, and many other scholars as well, is looking forward. They're looking to the future of the law and how we can apply equality um, more effectively and attract a majority interest in making interest convergence not a dual 
application where it starts with a positive and ends with limitations that hinder civil rights gains. Um, and so, so setting a path for understanding that the law has ideals, but those ideals have to be made real by people. The law is created by people, it's enforced by people, uh, it's, it's violated by people. And so humans make law and these are ways in which we can make the law more equitable. It's a very general overview of critical race theory and interest convergence. But the way I'm going to look at it tonight is looking backwards and, and using references uh, as Professor Bell has used with Brown versus Board of Education, for example, and bring it back to the 19th century, read it into the past and understand not just how white interests, uh, particularly surrounding the Emancipation Proclamation as a war measure, uh, how, how Black Americans also managed to affect their own self-interest. So even though these are limited gains, the actions that Black Americans were able to undertake in order to uh, create a space for themselves as citizens through the Civil War, how war created these conditions that Ameri Black Americans could take advantage of and to work on emancipation and then towards equality. So without further ado, I'll, I'll jump into this discussion of the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, basically, this is where it starts, where, where I'm looking at a, the interest convergence between the United States as a political entity and Black Americans as a group, but also as individuals. So the Emancipation Proclamation is such a fascinating case, and I could go on <laughs> for hours about the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, and it has these significant achievements where uh, President Lincoln is kind of, you know, putting his finger on the pulse of the war, what's acceptable, what he can do to make the war effort to preserve the Union successful. That is always his main consideration. And so the Emancipation Proclamation has significant limitations, as does the uh, military or the, the militia acts, the the Confiscation Acts of 1862, 1861, where these steps are taken haltingly towards enabling Black Americans to join the Union Army, first as laborers and then as soldiers. And so President Lincoln is looking towards the entire war effort. Uh, and for, for his idea of interest convergence, he's trying to keep the border states, these slave states within the Union, still within the Union without losing them to the Confederacy. So he has to walk a fine line when it comes to slavery. So for his part, he's interested in the preservation of the Union and emancipation becomes a war strategy and goal once it becomes apparent that that is a way of hindering the Confederacy from within. The Confederacy had long, or you know, these slave states within the South had long been concerned with this idea of the internal enemy that are Black Americans, that they want emancipation, that they want equality, and they might resort to violence in order to achieve that. It's kind of the, the ruling logic behind these slave codes and maintaining control, maintaining economic um, superiority, and, and continuing their particular interests. So it's when the interests of Black Americans, particularly in the South, coincides with the Union that emancipation becomes possible. Uh, but there are limitations and there's still lower pay for Black soldiers, um, the limited application to the areas for emancipation, uh, particular areas such as surrounding New Orleans uh, are exempt from the Emancipation Proclamation, whereas the areas that are not occupied by the Union to any degree, um, but the Confederacy itself has the Emancipation Proclamation applied to it. So this idea that uh, it is possible for you to leave your station as an enslaved person and join the, uni the Union Army, uh, either as a laborer or as a soldier. And this is revolutionary for quite a few reasons. And the Confederacy bucks against this because the Confederacy sees the opening the door to emancipation as opening the door to equality, uh, even though various people recognize that it's possible to limit the goals of, of emancipation by limiting equality through the law. But the, the cornerstone of the Confederacy is centered on white supremacy, centered on maintaining absolute control over the enslaved population. So there's very little room for considering the possibilities of allowing enslaved people to become fighters. There's a lot of fear surrounding it. And this concern that if we open the door to emancipation, we open the door to equality, which completely undercuts the cornerstone of the Confederacy as stated uh, by for Vice President uh, Alexander Stevens. 
So the Emancipation Proclamation kind of kicks off uh, this, this process of recruitment, which starts in the North, starts with free Black Americans. Uh, and so these initial efforts are very much ad hoc. They are uh, you know, basically affected by individuals, uh, by interested governors, such as John A. Andrew of uh, Massachusetts, pictured here, as well as philanthropists and businessmen, such as uh, OSB Wall, uh, pictured here who are pushing the United States government to centralize this process, to enable the recruitment, not just of free Black Americans, but all Black Americans, recognizing that striking a blow at slavery will strike a blow at the Confederacy itself from within. Um, you know, looking to these historical processes where foreign enemies such as the British for example, had taken advantage of uh, the, the tension between enslaved people and enslavers in the American Revolution, in the War of 1812. And so the US is looking to these precedents and trying to apply them, as are these particular military commanders, war governors like John Andrew, uh, and particularly some, some abolitionist-minded uh, commanders like Colonel William Burney, who becomes really important to this process, as well as General Lorenzo Thomas, who alone helps instigate, I think, about 41% of all of the Black recruits who end up joining the United States Colored Troops. So the U.S. recognizes that there are ways of you know, coordinating with the Black population to help its war efforts. And it's only ever a war measure, right? The Emancipation Proclamation is not affected through federal law. Uh, it is not codified through the legislature. It is an executive action as commander in chief by Lincoln to use essentially the enslaved population against the Confederacy from within. So this is the way in which the U.S. is casting this as a legally viable option for enabling emancipation. It's not striking at the border states that are still within the Union. It's only affecting the Confederacy, and it's only a war measure. The Confederacy, on the other hand, is very reluctant to do this. And by the time they start to uh, attempt to recruit Black soldiers from the enslaved population, it is very much too late. Now, Major General Patrick Cleburne is really the first major commander to suggest this move. Uh, he states that to uh, open up uh, the, the ranks to enslaved people would not necessarily result in emancipation or excuse me, inequality, that emancipation was not necessarily a step to equality, but it would at least help the Confederacy as a war aim. So he's pushing for this in 1864, which is relatively late. And he says, you know, through necessity and wise legislation, this would ensure no material change. Uh, but he is very much not <laughs> supported in this initially. And it takes until uh, General Robert E. Lee starts advocating for it around February 1865, January 1865, very late in the war, uh, that any attempts are made to use enslaved people as soldiers. Up to this point, Enslavers have been, and the Confederacy has been thinking of manpower for Black soldiers uh, and, and Black people solely through labor. Uh, they are impressing free Black men, they're impressing enslaved Black men, but only to work on fortifications, only to work in the capacity that has historically been accorded to them, which has property to be used at the will of enslavers first and the state second. On the other hand, the United States and, and Black men as well, are looking at manpower not just as a means of labor and as fighting power, but power as men. That the presence in the armed services of a nation affords legitimacy and citizenship to a degree that hadn't been possible for the majority of Black Americans to this point. So the idea of manpower, I think, is twofold for Black Americans. And so I think this is a very appropriate theme for tonight. So Black Americans, uh, in, in the midst of all of this, you know, the Confederacy is kind of refusing to uh, use the four million and, and you know, about one million uh, military-aged enslaved Black men uh, within the Confederacy for those purposes, for military efforts um, in terms of fighting. Whereas Black Americans are basically acting out of their own self-interest wherever opportunities are possible. And they have a variety of means 
in which to do this. And this is very much apparent by the initial acts of self-emancipation that are starting well before the war, but continue throughout the early period. Um, you know, people like Robert Smalls, uh, Henry Jarvis, who are escaping to union lines, forcing the issue, forcing the union to, to deal with the reality of their willingness to support the union's cause. And so that self-interest uh, basically ends up working out in the long run at least during the war. Uh, but it takes a while for the shift to happen where efforts become centralized to enlist free and enslaved Black men in the slave states especially. And so these efforts are made possible first by recruiting officers, but they are limited to the vicinities of occupied territory, and then the actions of enslaved men themselves. And this is, this is a good uh, show, I think, of how the process was made possible. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples of men who were able to take advantage of the U.S. coming in to Confederate lines. Um, and I'll just try to wrap up because I know I'm running out of time. But basically, we have men like Abram Rawls, uh, who could not escape uh, from his situation. He was located around here uh, between Gadsden and Center, Alabama, until July 1864, at which point the Union has started to encroach upon this territory. And knowing that the Union is present in Georgia, he's able to take advantage of the presence of the Union in order to escape. But he has to escape. He cannot do so voluntarily. His enslaver will not let him do so voluntarily. So he's navigating through the nighttime over 40 miles of terrain. He gets to, to Dalton, Georgia, or uh, yes, Dalton, Georgia, and has to work there until he's finally signed up for the 44th United States Colored Infantry. And then uh, we have examples like the Fraction Brothers, who are from Blacksburg, uh, right here in Blacksburg in Montgomery County, who weren't able to effect their escape until 1865 in April, after the assassination of Lincoln. And they're situated around here. And you can see that this encroachment of the Union Army enables easier paths for people to make their way to Union lines and sign up but uh, they're still encountering these issues where they can either fight, flight, or freeze, as I would like to say. Um, and we see examples of this that you know work together as well, where you can fight, flight, or freeze in many different combinations. Mm -hmm. uh, you can flee, but then have to wait mm -hmm. patiently to sign up, depending on the situation available to you. Um, the, the Louisiana Native Guards, for example, who transform into the Corps d'Afrique, um, the, the you know, presence of Black men who are using soldiers by any means possible, whether it's with the Confederacy or the Union, to affect emancipation is incredibly important. So to wrap up, uh, as I know I'm running out of time, I just want to say that I think these, these movements are super interesting because it shows the complexity of how interest convergence works, where we have these large-scale considerations with warfare that people like President Lincoln have to keep in mind, where if they focus on Black emancipation too early, they could lose the border states, which are, you know, filled with slaveholders, and that would shift the war in, in a direction that the Union would not necessarily be able to fight against effectively. So losing more states is a major, major concern for Lincoln. And so he's not acting in interests of Black Americans because he feels he has to act in certain different interests for the war effort. Uh, and Black Americans are taking these grassroots movements, essentially, they're speaking with their feet and later with uniforms and guns, essentially, to, to take freedom where they can. And they can't always do it as soon as it's available to them. They sometimes have to wait. Uh, they, they lie. They, they, you know, keep in mind considerations like their family's safety, uh, where to go, where to, where to stay, essentially. They have to wait for information. But all in all, this consideration of how the Confederates essentially failed to make use um, and enable emancipation as a means of persisting through the war effort helped lead to the failure uh, of the Confederacy, whereas the United States was able to coincide interests with Black Americans, and Black Americans are acting in their own self-interests throughout all of this. Um, so I think there's this really interesting kind of umbrella term through interest convergence that shows how the war developed and how people basically uh, undertook what they had to in order to survive. So with that, I believe my time is up <laughs> and I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you very much.
Our second speaker tonight is Emmanuel Dabney, and he's a graduate of Richard Bland College, the University of Mary Washington, and also UNC Greensboro. And since 2001, he's been employed by the National Park Service at Petersburg National Battlefield. So if you have visited those uh, terrific facilities um, at Petersburg, you've probably either seen Emmanuel or at least benefited from the great work he has done there. His title for tonight is The Forced Participation of Free Blacks in Confederate Virginia. Over to you. Thanks so much going to attempt to share my screen. I can find the screen. I can hopefully get started. Oops, wrong thing. Uh, okay. Ooh, great. <laughs> so thanks everyone for joining tonight. I am going to be like uh, like Dr. Newhall before me and try to be quick because we don't have a lot of time. I want to leave time for people to ask questions. Uh, just to be clear, this talk is not about Black Confederate soldiers. Um, other people have written about this issue uh, and all of its complexities, and um, that is not what this talk is about. Instead, it's about what Confederacy spent most of its time during the Civil War focused on, was how to extract labor uh, to free up white men to serve in the army, and for, uh, in, in this case, free black men to uh, participate in other ways. So, um, look forward to our discussion later, but we'll start with the reality that there's, uh, as the Confederate capital moved to Richmond, there are two governments operating within uh, Virginia. Uh, the Virginia state government, uh, the General Assembly and the governor and the Confederate uh, Congress, which meets in the Virginia state capital, uh, as well as of course the Confederate president and, and his cabinet. Uh, immediately, just soon after the uh, war begins in the spring of 1861, the Confederacy is looking to see how they can extract labor from free black men, just people who were not enslaved. And in Virginia in July of 1861, on the very first day of the month, uh, the General Assembly passed the first of several laws about uh, their participation in the war. And it was very clear what they were looking for, men of prime age between 18 and 50 to um, do very arduous labor uh, in constructing earthworks and other tasks. And this uh, comes at an interesting moment as the war is just starting, uh, as the Confederate government had just moved to Richmond, but already there was a campaign of constructing earthworks around the new Confederate capital. And in the city council in Richmond, which is the third government that's operating in Richmond during the war, uh, just seven days after the General Assembly passed this new law, they uh, decided that they were going to um, encourage the mayor to uh, force uh, free black men to participate in constructing these earthworks. On the 12th of February, 1862, the General Assembly passed uh, another law. Uh, and it's again, really focused on forcing sheriffs, constables, local court systems to enroll free black men between 18 and 50 years of age, as they said, to construct batteries, fortifications, uh, and other uh, tasks. As, as sort of illustrated in this uh, London newspaper uh, from 1863. Uh, this is happening in tandem with conversations about using enslaved men to construct fortifications, but slaveholders are not overly eager uh, to let people go to the front. 
In part, it's about the health of the enslaved people that they own. In part, it's relevant to what Dr. Newall was just talking about in terms of people escaping. If they're closer to the federal lines, they are going to be more apt to be able to escape in within the, the federal army's lines. Uh, so slaveholders are excited by this new February 1862 law because it would hopefully reduce the needs of sending enslaved people to the front. Uh, this new law also forced a, a set of fines. The sheriffs and constables who refused to deliver these free black men could be fined $100. Uh, free black men who evaded the uh, authorities could be forced uh, to pay anywhere between fifty and one hundred and fifty dollars uh, for their uh, lack of participation in the uh, Confederate war effort. So debate continued in 1862 and 1863 uh, about the participation of free black men in the uh, Confederate war effort. And of course, we see this play out uh, most prominently, uh, most easily accessible, if you're interested yourself, in newspapers. Uh, and so the Richmond Daily Dispatch, which you can find online, the editor wrote in uh, January of 1863, a week after the Emancipation Proclamation, the governor thinks it would be wise to enact a law requiring all free Negroes now resident in those portions of the state which have been overrun by the enemy to be removed and be put to work upon the fortifications. I advise, therefore, that you pass a law authorizing Confederate commanders to arrest the free Negroes, list them, and deliver them over to the proper officer of the Confederate government for this or any other service which is required. They will receive good wages and be provided with rations. When the danger passes by, they can return to their homes. Here we have you know, a need that the editor of the Richmond Daily Dispatch sees, and he's not alone. Confederate engineer Jeremy Gilmer wrote to Robert E. Lee in March of 1863 about the unfinished earthworks at Petersburg. Uh, he compiled uh, his request that Lee demand that the War Department seek 1,029 uh, free black men on top of about 2,000 enslaved men uh, to participate in uh, the construction process at Petersburg. The county with the least amount that he requested was Madison, it's north of Charlottesville area, if you're familiar with Virginia, and that was only seven people. The greatest amount of people came from Southampton County in the southeastern part of the state, 142, and for the city of Petersburg and Charles City counties to deliver 100 men each. This debate went on as free black men continued to evade or not participate in the process. The Richmond Daily Dispatch's editor in November of 1863 writing, there are free Negroes enough in Virginia to perform all the necessary work upon fortifications and railroads without impressing slaves for that purpose. There are enough worthless and lazy creatures of this class in this city who could dig sufficient dirt to make Richmond as impregnable as Gibraltar. Our authorities ought to put every one of them to the shovel and pickaxe and make them render some consideration to the community for the bread and meat they devour. At present, they are neither ornamental nor useful. It is high time they should be put to some account. Clearly reflecting his prejudices about uh, free people uh, here in Virginia. This waxing and waning went on within the halls of the Confederate Congress and the Virginia State Capitol. Uh, but in February of 1864, on the 17th of the month, the Confederate government did step in, requesting 20,000 uh, enslaved men be sent forward and all free male Negroes, as they said, again, between 18 and 50 years of age, 
to do any work that the Confederate government needed from constructing earthworks to making munitions uh, and working in hospitals. Initially, uh, the government uh, ruling was that these people would be paid uh, about $11 a month. In November of 1864, Confederate Congress amended that to increase pay to $18 a month. And just keeping in mind about Confederate inflation, um, that by uh, the summer of 1864, uh, barrel of flour is in excess of $150. So we're, we're not talking about a lot of money. In addition to this earthwork campaign that was going on across uh, Virginia and indeed across the Confederacy, uh, free blacks uh, were crucial to the operation of Confederate hospitals. Uh, this image here is a detail of a map of the Library of Congress showing uh, the uh, Winder Hospital in Richmond. If people are familiar with Richmond, it's uh, in the vicinity of Bird Park today. In the spring of 1862, just prior to the bloodiest part of the war uh, that, would, that would be fought up to that point, uh, the Richmond Daily Dispatch featured an ad asking for a hundred free uh, black men to come as nurses to this hospital. And the ad stated, if the parties go willingly, good wages will be paid. And kind treatment afforded them. If they do not volunteer, they will be impressed. Again, this, if you come willingly, we will be nice. If you don't, we're going to force you to do it anyway. The same sort of uh, rhetoric repeated in 1863 at the end of the year in advance of the even bloodier uh, 1864 campaign that would ultimately land Union and Confederate forces around Richmond and Petersburg. Uh, but that ad noted by pressing free Negroes of both sexes into the service of being uh, nurses at hospitals, uh, then enslaved people would not be forced to go in as many numbers, again, making slaveholders happy at the detriment of free black people. The editor continued, if white men can be taken from their families and made to serve in the country, surely free Negroes can be usefully employed, calling uh, these people idle and filled with vice. But free blacks did a whole lot of other work, working for railroads, they worked in salt, lead, and iron mines, uh, they were cooks, they were teamsters, uh, just a variety of, of work that white men now could not do as the Confederacy continuously, starting in 1862, expanded their uh, conscription act. Perhaps the greatest irony uh, of of the war, uh, I think, is the amount of black labor that it's going to take to produce the very ammunition to kill uh, US soldiers uh, throughout the South. Uh, it's a combination of free black men and enslaved black people. Uh, and so I, I think this has just not been fully understood. And I think it's perhaps best understood at Tredegar Ironworks in Richmond, the Confederacy's largest ironworks. They made the most Confederate cannon and ammunition for that cannon, uh, railroad cars, all sorts of things that would, that would sustain the Confederacy. And it's you know, partially still around. Um, in this 1865 photo, uh, we're seeing Tredegar Ironworks. You can go to the American Civil War Museum. The Richmond National Battlefield has a visitor center operation on the grounds of Tredegar in, in the present day. Uh, the red star here marks the location of the 1861 gun foundry at Tredegar. And among the people who, who worked there uh, was a man named Robert Pleasant. He had been employed as a tobacco warehouse worker. Um, uh, I'm sorry, not Robert Pleasant. <laughs> um, but uh, Manson Smith, that's what I'm thinking of, who uh, was working there in 1863, 1864. Uh, there are 
just a number of people who are able to find new employment uh, because of the war. These people who never would have thought about working there before. There was a carpenter working there uh, who is identified in the 1860 census. Um, but increasingly as the war went on, there's fewer and fewer opportunities for black men to free black men to earn money uh, on their own accord because the Confederate war effort is so intense. And, and as the war goes on, there's more and more slave labor working alongside uh, the diminishing numbers of white men and increasing numbers of, of free black men. Um, there is a, just a kind of an exciting uh, thing um, of, of thinking about all the effort that has been devoted, attention since really, you know, the late 1800s about who the Civil War soldiers were, both Union and Confederate, not as much attention devoted to uh, who the free Black people are in the Confederacy, who is making uh, the Confederacy function. Uh, and, and even today, <laughs> as, as we sort of see people writing and researching about enslaved people during the Civil War, I see uh, confusion about people uh, and their status. Um, and, and so I just thought I'd take a second to sort of highlight who some of these people were. Uh, Ballard Trent Edwards, uh, who ended up becoming a uh, post-war member of the General Assembly, was a pre-war bricklayer in Manchester, uh, the town just across from uh, Richmond, uh, which is now within the city's limits. As a property owner, he was married by 1864. Uh, he's living with his uh, mother-in-law, his wife, and their seven children. And in November of that year, he was conscripted, which means he was forced to leave the work that he had been doing uh, and uh, go work on the Richmond Danville Railroad. In the center here is James Lipscomb, who also became a post-war member of the General Assembly. Uh, and uh, he had been a carriage driver prior to the Civil War working for a white family in Richmond. Uh, but in November of 1864, he too was conscripted by the Confederate government, his case to go uh, work for the engineer department. And, uh, you know, I, th I think about Lipscomb in particular, because by the 1880s, he owns over 500 acres of land in Cumberland County. Uh, what would his life have been like prior to the war and had the war not had to happen because slavery would somehow have not existed, uh, that uh, how much more successful he could have become. Uh, some free black men testified about their wartime experiences. Uh, Benjamin Summers of Norfolk probably with one of the most difficult uh, accounts. And, and I think it's important to hear from these people. So I'm gonna read what he had to say. In 1861 or 62, I was taken handcuffed and carried to Craney Island and made to work on the earthworks with ball and chain on my legs. I was kept there two months when my legs were so bad from the chain that I was sent back to Suffolk. This was by the Confederate authorities. And because I did not want to go and try to get away I was given 500 lashes and then rubbed down with salt brine. And he exhibited his body to uh, a white man involved uh, with his testimony who described his hips looking as though large pieces of flesh had been dug out. You think about enslaved people being uh, tortured by enslavers, but the Confederate government and its uh, various members of the white uh, society that composed the Confederate government uh, military uh, also did this uh, to Benjamin Summers, a so-called free black person. And probably the most you know, meaningful uh, oral testimonies about this uh, time period for me, and I know that some of my family members are, are participating tonight, um, is the testimony of my uh, great, great uncles, Robert Dabney and Benjamin Dabney. 
So the two of them had additional brothers, George, John, and my great-great-grandfather, Henry, who's pictured here on the far right. And at various points during the war, they were forced to go work for the Confederate government. And uh, Uncle Benjamin uh, would uh, testify later, I was impressed into the rebel service several times during the war. In 1862, I was taken to Manassas for what they said would be 60 days service, but it was a year before I was discharged. I drove an army wagon. Several times after, I was compelled to work on the fortifications. I never bore arms or took any oath. My great great uncle, uh, Robert, was made a teamster by the Confederate government in 1861. Uh, he was told he would only be away for 60 days. It turned into six months. He escaped from where he was and came back home. And then he said, the day after I got home, a rebel officer came for me. I refused to go with him. He drew his pistol. I told him he might shoot, but I would not go. My family were starving. And besides, I was unfit for service. This Confederate officer may have been a white cousin of his, uh, but whomever it was told him to get a doctor's certificate excusing him from further uh, harassment. And that was true until late in the war when Robert joined uh, his brothers, including my great-great-grandfather Henry, in working with the Confederate engineers on constructing earthworks for the Confederates to defend uh, Petersburg. And that was the case, uh, even as Petersburg was evacuated, as the Confederate army retreated westward uh, and then ended up at the rural crossroads of Appomattox Courthouse. But on the night of April 8th, 1865, uh, Henry, his brothers, uh, and two other free black men managed to get out of the Confederate lines and begin their trek back home to their farms, only to discover that their farm was now in wreck, thanks to the Union troops and their uh, temporary uh, occupation of said farms after the Battle of Five Forks in April of 1865. So I'll stop there and stop sharing and I will turn it over. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, what a powerful story to end on too. I really appreciate that. Um, so last but not least, our final speaker for this evening is David Gulman. He teaches history at George Mason University. He's also an emeritus assistant professor, uh, editor, excuse me, at the papers of Abraham Lincoln. And he's currently working on a book about horses and horsemanship in the Civil War era. And I first got to know him. He received a research grant to come to Virginia Tech to use our special collections to research this project. And I enjoyed learning about his project then. And when I decided to do this uh, Civil War weekend on the theme of resources, uh, he immediately came to mind. So I'm really glad he's able to come back virtually, of course, to Virginia Tech and share his research tonight. His title, as you can see up on the screen, great quotation, as much a military supply as a barrel of gunpowder, wartime horses and mule purchases. Thank you. Over to you. Ah, thank you very much, Paul. And thanks to everyone at Virginia Tech uh, for making this possible. I, my only regret is that it is virtual and it's not being held on the uh, the beautiful campus, which I very, very much uh, enjoyed uh, visiting. Um, first of all, let, let me apologize in advance. Uh, I am going to proceed with as much speed and dispatch uh, as I can. Uh, so uh, this may turn out to be somewhat of an academic mule kick uh, to the audience out there. So my apologies in advance, but I'll try to get through as much as I can this evening uh, with all due speed. Um, First of all, I think it's important to mention uh, the rise of animal studies as part of the study of history. Uh, it's a growing field, a field of which uh, I've been uh, happy to be a part. Uh, and uh, uh, we also have to remember that the horse has been probably the most valuable animal uh, in human service since domestication. Really, the society that we live in now would not have existed uh, without the labor of 
the horse and uh, its cousin, uh, the mule. Uh, and really from domestication and in the first historical records that we have on file, whether they be biblical or otherwise, uh, when the horse is mentioned, usually it's connected to war, uh, that the horse was uh, rapidly put to use uh, in military service, whether that be uh, for the ancient Egyptians or, or uh, whoever. Uh, it didn't take humankind long to discover that armed men on foot versus armed men on horse, uh, armed man on horse usually wins. Uh, and so horses became an extremely valuable military resource, uh, as I said, since domestication right up through the Second World War. Um, it's not been that long since horses played a, a major role both in war uh, and in our uh, society uh, in general. Uh, and indeed, this was recognized uh, at the time of uh, the Civil War, uh, that horses were going to be a very valuable uh, war resource, uh, and both in northern and southern press, there will be occasional comments about uh, how the horse is going to serve its patriotic duty uh, in uh, either winning Southern independence or uh, restoring and upholding uh, the Union. Uh, and indeed, <clears throat> pardon, indeed, uh, questions about horse care uh, during the war will reach all the way uh, to the White House. In fact, uh, the letter that I found back in 1996 in the National Archives by uh, Alonzo Still is the one who really got me thinking more and more about this topic, about horses uh, in the Civil War in particular. Uh, I think modern readers, perhaps uh, those uh, who have no experience with uh, livestock, tend to think of uh, you know them rather like vehicles, that they can be uh, used when needed, set aside when not, uh, and ready to go uh, at the next um, and the next possible need. And if uh, horses, despite their size and power, are actually rather uh, delicate creatures, uh, certainly in their feet uh, and in their digestive systems. Uh, and indeed, Alonzo still will uh, write to President Lincoln requesting uh, that he do something for greater care uh, of army livestock. Uh, and you think that, that such a letter would really go nowhere. Uh, but uh, it goes from the White House to the War Department and makes its way through various bureaus uh, to act upon, or at least uh, be, uh, be uh, recognized as of worth. Uh, the United States in, in 1860, uh, interestingly enough, uh, is the most populous horse nation in the world. Uh, we have exactly double uh, the number of horses of our closest rival, and that was Russia. Uh, interestingly, also, uh, we're approaching uh, about the same number, number of about 6.2 million horses uh, in the United States currently. But that was the total, uh, thanks to the U.S. Census. We know this of 1860. Uh, and uh, the horses were not, of course, evenly distributed just as population. Uh, surprising to many, uh, the greatest horse state in the Union in 1860 it wasn't Virginia, wasn't Kentucky, it was Ohio. Uh, Ohio had the largest number of animals. And in the South, uh, Virginia led the way uh, and uh, Texas uh, came in roughly about second, although uh, Texas was a far more complicated uh, issue being so far away and uh, having many of those horses, I think, running around uh, practically wild. Uh, and then, of course, there was the issue of mules. Uh, in the South, uh, the South will lead the nation in mule population. But those numbers are actually going to be deceptive. Uh, the southern plantation economy actually imports on a yearly basis large numbers of horses and mules uh, from states like Missouri, uh, Kentucky, and Ohio. Uh, that while the South has the largest mule population at the start of the war, uh, they are not supplying their own numbers. Many of those come from elsewhere, and in case anyone doesn't know, uh, mules cannot self-reproduce. Uh, mules are the product of a cross uh, between usually a uh, male donkey and a, a mare, a female horse. Uh, 
so uh, that certainly was an issue that, you know, they, they're very useful creatures, but they do not self-reproduce. Uh, we estimate about 1.5 million horses and mules died uh, or were killed during the war, about double the human casualties. Uh, and horses were recognized uh, as critical war making uh, a critical war making resource. In fact, it's Montgomery Meggs who uses the phrase uh, that horses are just like a barrel of gunpowder, uh, that they should be confiscated whenever they are found. Uh, none should be left for enemy use. In 1863, just as the federal government uh, is banning uh, the export of any horses to any other nation, uh, Canada, for example, uh, you have the Confederacy actually trying to import uh, import from Mexico. There were even some suggestions about trying to run horses through the uh, blockade, uh, which was um, ridiculously impossible. Uh, in fact, there's only one horse that I know of that actually ran the blockade on a blockade runner, uh, and that was an Arab that was a, a gift horse uh, to Jefferson Davis, a horse apparently that was extremely bad tempered, uh, and only Jefferson Davis could actually uh, ride it. Well, for the U.S. Army, uh, just as any other supply, uh, horses and mules were purchased by contract bid. Uh, and, of course, the lowest bidder uh, got the contract. Uh, while it worked quite well overall, there certainly were problems. Uh, oftentimes, uh, not the best animals were being secured because, of course, uh, everyone was trying to uh, buy for the lowest possible price. Uh, you also had people, quite naturally, I suppose, uh, taking the opportunity of the government buying large numbers of animals to get rid of uh, their most problematic, uh, most ill-tempered uh, animal that they might have in uh, their stable. It wasn't until 1864 that there were changes in the law that allowed farmers to sell, in a sense, directly to the government in smaller numbers two, three, four, five, uh, et cetera. Otherwise they had to be purchased in large numbers. Uh, the Confederacy relies on uh, really the system that went back to the American Revolution, the War of 1812, uh, that uh, especially for the cavalry, that private individuals would bring private horses from home. Uh, they would receive about 40 cents a day for their use and supposedly uh, be provided with forage. And if the animal was killed in battle, uh, they would be compensated for that animal at the price it was appraised for when it entered uh, service. Uh, this also means, of course, that if your animal dies of sickness, uh, is struck by lightning, or somehow, you know, has a non-battlefield death, uh, you are out of luck. Uh, you are not going to be comp compensated for that. Uh, and he, even if you were, for example, if you brought a horse uh, into the Confederate Army in 1861, that was appraised for $200, which was a good price at that time. Uh, by 1863-64, uh, $200 isn't going to do very much for you trying to purchase uh, any kind of replacement. You're looking at thousands of dollars uh, per animal by then. In fact, we even have Confederate leaders at the end of the war saying that uh, their policies for horsing their army was uh, radically wrong. And uh, indeed, uh, initially, Union forces used this same, uh, when the war first broke out in the summer of 61, uh, you had a number of Union units organized exactly uh, the same way. Uh, but Union forces, uh, especially Army administration, is going to begin to phase that out. By 1863, uh, any privately held animals in union service are going to be purchased by the federal government uh, and uh, no additional, uh, no new ones were going to be uh, provided. Or that is, uh, the federal government would provide animals that were disabled or killed uh, in service. Uh, now, uh, there were the Union could do things the Confederacy could not uh, for a number of reasons, a larger ho horse population, uh, a larger revenue stream uh, that, uh, for example, Union forces specified uh, that animals had to be a certain age, 
from four to nine years, later they'll shift that to six to 10, uh, that uh, they were to be of a particular color, uh, dark hues were preferred, uh, and that they were to be geldings. Uh, no mares, no stallions were to be purchased by the Union Army uh, for military use. And there were a number of reasons for that, uh, but it was impossible to exclude all mares uh, from Union service, so there will be some uh, that will get in there. The Confederacy, of course, is in no way uh, able to restrict any type of animal uh, that was going to be brought into or purchased into uh, Confederate service. Uh, and indeed, when it comes to mules, there were also uh, requirements and, um, and restrictions. Uh, in fact, co in color scheme, iron gray mules were preferred, no light uh, colored mules, no, uh, no uh, whites or dappled. Uh, apparently it, at the time, it was a 19th century uh, myth, I think, as, as it turns out, that iron gray mules had better stamina. Uh, and indeed mules uh, are in many ways the unsung heroes of the war. Both armies will rely on them uh, for motive power for their baggage and supply trains. Uh, without the mule, uh, Confederate, or pardon me, Civil War armies do not move. Uh, they also are often uh, longer live than horses. That is, they, they uh, can eat worse food, they can be worse treated, and were. Uh, they can do better in harsher conditions uh, than horses. Uh, and so very quickly, both armies will uh, start eliminating horses from their wagon trains uh, and replacing them with mules. Uh, there are even accounts of uh, mule teams purchased in 1861 that are still in Union Army service in 1865 uh, and were, you know, good to go for years, uh, years past. Uh, usually it was in the in inspection process uh, that there were early on in the war that there were shenanigans uh, with uh, contractors bribing inspectors to pass uh, horses that were not quite up to snuff uh, and, of course, collect from the U.S. government. Uh, eventually, the Army will crack down on that uh, to the point that uh, every animal purchased by the Union Army by 1864 will have several brands on it, uh, including uh, the initials of the inspector that passed them. Uh, so if the animal reaches the front and it's not serviceable, uh, they could trace it exactly back to who passed it uh, and punishments could then be meted out. Uh, Price-wise, uh, both Union and Confederacy, uh, the prices are, are the same at the, uh, the start of the war, anywhere from 50 to $120 basically. Uh, and of course, as the war goes on, as the need goes up, uh, you have prices go up as well. Uh, until the, by the end of the war, you're, look, you're looking at prices hovering around $200 uh, each uh, for horses and mules for the Union Army. And in the Confederacy, uh, basically prices have spiraled almost completely out of control. You're looking at two, three thousand dollars uh, to try to replace an animal. And you have Southerners who are refusing to sell to the Confederate Army unless they pay in gold and unless they pay cash uh, immediately. Uh, by the end of the war, you have even Robert E. Lee trying to figure out if, you know, can we somehow uh, sift horses from Union states into the Confederacy uh, and solve our horsing problem that way. Uh, of course, the Union also benefits in having a better transportation network uh, in order to get uh, these vast numbers of animals that are being purchased uh, to the front, both by rail uh, and by water. Uh, the Confederacy actually will restrict uh, the shipment of any animals by rail. That in the Confederacy, if you're mounted and you're heading to war, you're riding. Uh, you are not going to be allowed uh, to use any of the few trains that the Confederacy has uh, available. Uh, and both North and South, uh, it, at least officially on paper, uh, the rations that uh, the animals are to be provided uh, were basically the same. They're both using uh, the old U.S. Army uh, regulations in order to uh, say, you know, you need uh, 10 pounds of hay, you need 14 pounds of grain uh, for each animal uh, per day. 
Uh, both armies, of course, will encounter shortages of that. And of course, in the Confederacy, it's going to be much, uh, much worse in trying to uh, certainly get, you know, forages big and bulky, uh, getting it transported to the front is very difficult, very expensive, and the Confederacy is going to have uh, real issues with that. Confederate armies are gonna be, uh, certainly their animals are going to be reduced in flesh and practically starving uh, at a number of occasions during the war. So uh, union resources in transport and because of ongoing mechanization of agriculture, will make supplying Union armies in the field uh, much easier than it really had ever previously been in warfare. And I just have a, a number of totals there. Uh, the vast amount of grain and hay purchases that were made uh, during the war is really quite uh, extraordinary. And there were even some fun things, at least I find them fun, uh, suggested. Uh, one of the, the favorite things that I found in the archives was, a, as you see, a sketch and a suggestion for what was called an electric battery saddle. Uh, it was a saddle that apparently had an electric battery underneath it, uh, and that battery would power uh, two sort of small Gatling guns uh, that would be mounted on the horse's withers, and it would be fired uh, by a pedal within the stirrup, much like uh, your car's gas pedal. Uh, kudos for the inventiveness of the individual who thought this up. Uh, it was, of course, wildly impractical, and of course, it, it never goes beyond uh, the design stage. Uh, also, more practical, but also uh, didn't go very far in the war, was a suggestion and an experimentation for concentrated horse feed, uh, basically ground up grain in cooked pellets uh, that could be carried on campaign. And it was billed as food for man and beast, uh, that if men ran short of rations, they could actually take a scoop of this pelleted form uh, and throw it in hot water and make some sort of a mush, uh, which you could enjoy if necessary. Well, of course, armies, 19th century armies are gonna be battling the weather as well as uh, each other. Uh, that both heat and cold are going to prove to be uh, enormous difficulties to have to overcome on active campaign. Uh, whether it's freezing winter or sunstroke uh, in the summer, uh, the animals are going to suffer uh, quite readily from that uh, because they're already under stress and duress, uh, certainly on campaign. Uh, and indeed, uh, you have people like uh, Charles Francis Adams writing home saying, you know, if you could only see the animals on which these dashing cavalry raids that the newspaper is reporting, if you could only see what they actually look like, you would uh, be horrified. They don't look anything like uh, it, they do uh, in paintings or uh, in illustrations uh, with their ribs sticking out. And so even just marching uh, without battle in the offing was a draining and difficult uh, process. Four miles an hour was considered a uh, killing uh, to horses. Uh, and so armies uh, whether they be Union and Confederate, uh, are constantly losing animals, uh, whether or not, um, you know, they're facing an enemy or not. Uh, and part of this loss comes from inexperience of troopers, uh, poor commanders, uh, oftentimes early in the war when you have civilians in, in command of units, uh, they don't take very good care of their animals, uh, and that certainly uh, is uh, a detriment, and it, and it quickly shows. It was said early on that you could tell uh, immediately a unit whether they had an old army, a West Pointer in command, uh, or a civilian by the shape of their animals. And indeed, uh, in battle, uh, these animals, the horses especially, uh, were targets for both counter-battery fire and sniper fire. Uh, because, of course, they're A, a large target, target and B, uh, if you can kill enough of them, uh, the artillery battery can be far more easily captured. And so uh, you will have fire purposely directed uh, toward the, the caisson and limber teams that would be uh, standing just off from the firing line uh, of an active engagement. And then, of course, you will have uh, at Gettysburg, some 3,000 animals are killed. Uh, and at the Siege of Chattanooga, roughly about 10,000 animals 
uh, are going to be killed or starved to death uh, because of the restrictors of supply. Uh, and by 1864, uh, Union authorities will make uh, a ruling and, and say that no longer, if an animal breaks down on the march, we're not turning it loose anymore. Too many of those animals branded U.S. are ending up in the Confederate Army. Uh, if an animal breaks down or becomes inoperable on the march, they're going to be shot. Uh, they're going to be killed immediately. We're not going to let them uh, end up uh, and used by our enemies, which was what, what was happening. Uh, you have men that comment on this, that this poor animal, you know, only needs a few days rest and actual food, uh, and you have to kill it because you're not letting it behind for the enemy to use against you. Uh, and indeed, this is an issue throughout the war, whether uh, in the field or behind the lines. What do you do uh, with these large numbers of dead animals? And uh, interestingly enough, there is money to be made in them. Uh, that by 1864, you have contractors that are bidding uh, for the dead animals that are having to be shot because they're glandered, they have a contagious disease, uh, and indeed, uh, you know, for a dollar thirty for an, a U.S. Army horse carcass, uh, if you're a rendering contractor, you could profit up to five dollars if you part that animal out. Uh, you know, uh, take off the skin, the the hide, uh, the hooves can uh, be sold for glue, etc., and you could end up profiting five dollars. There were reports that one. A contractor in 1864 made a $60,000 profit on it. Uh, so while a grisly business, uh, it wasn't an unprofitable one. And unlike the Confederacy, here again, resources matter, uh, the Union Army was able to build very large, and certainly for the day, very complex remount depots. Uh, there was one just outside Washington here, uh, in uh, what is now, I think, Bowling Air Force Base. It's right across from uh, Reagan National Airport, uh, Guysboro Point. Uh, and it was uh, over 600 acres. It could hold up to 30,000 head. Uh, and it was a very uh, interesting complex. They had uh, all sorts of um, steam-driven mills. Uh, they eventually will have hospital stables. One of the problems both North and South have is there are no real trained veterinarians in the United States. Uh, there are, I found very few records and the few that do exist are usually foreign trained uh, from Denmark, from France, from England, uh, et cetera. Uh, and indeed, if an animal is, is able to make it back from the front, uh, back to one of these remount depots, they have about a 50-50 chance or a little better uh, of being uh, cured or at least being rehabilitated and put back in service uh, or uh, sold back to private purchases, purchasers. Uh, by the end of the war, uh, having built up this large military uh, complex, uh, the armies are going to, by this point, of course, by 1865, by April, May, it's the Union Army only, uh, and uh, you're going to have to unload all these animals. Uh, and so there will be national, basically uh, a national military liquidation sale uh, of all these horses and mules uh, purchased by the army. Uh, and uh, they'll, they'll go for bargain basement prices. Uh, there were some suggestions that perhaps... Uh, uh, Union veterans should get a special bonus, uh, get them at lower prices, but it was really not necessary. Uh, animals that had been purchased for $200 uh, in, shall we say, March of 65, uh, by May of 65 are selling for 50 or 60. Uh, and so uh, having built up the army, the, the army is going to have to be uh, uh, demobilized and selling off all these animals will be necessary. Uh, at the end of the wars, in a sense, the long-term impact, uh, by 1870, the Confederacy, pardon me, the states of the former Confederacy uh, have uh, nearly 250,000 less horses than they had in 1860. Uh, the North, on the other hand, uh, will gain 1.2 million. And uh, I, I think I'm going over time as is, so I will stop there uh, and say, if anything I've said interests you, uh, there's lots more information in uh, an upcoming book on animals in the Civil War, of which I have a chapter of by almost the same title. So uh, I will stop now. I will turn it back over to Paul, and I await your questions with eagerness. 
Thank you very much. Uh, three fascinating talks. We've already got a good number of questions on the table, so thanks very much for sending those in. And I'm going to start with a question for Caroline. Uh, there, there were a kind of cluster of questions in one way or another relating to Lincoln's role in all of this, uh, including the nature of his authority uh, over the Confederate States in the Emancipation Proclamation, also the evolution of his stance over time. So the way the question was phrased, you know, did he know in 1861 that he was at some point going to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, um, or was it more of a decision he came to over time? And then finally, uh, another person was asking about the um, impact of Frederick Douglass on Abraham Lincoln's thinking on emancipation. So I realized that's a lot. You could do at least one book on that question alone. Um, so just feel free to uh, attack any part of the question you want to. Absolutely. Uh, so yes, Lincoln is a really interesting case. Uh, and there are so many good works on this. Um, so I, I'm only scratching the very bare minimum of the surface of this topic. But Lincoln was not an advocate for emancipation. He was not for the majority of the war. Even when he initiated emancipation, he had many hesitations about it. He did not think that the federal government had the legality and the standing in order to affect that. He thought it was a state's right issue. And that was always his stance. Uh, and he tried to reassure the Southern, st the Southern states about this during his um, presidential campaign, which was that he believed in limiting the spread of slavery, but didn't want to get rid of it where it existed. He felt that self-determination was you know, the course that had to be followed by the states. And if emancipation was to happen, it had to be affected at the state level. Uh, so he did not start out the war with an idea of emancipating slaves, of enacting equality. That was something he came to as a war strategy. And something that he kind of had to be goaded into, particularly by people like Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass met with Lincoln constantly throughout the war. He was consistently advocating for allowing Black Americans to participate, uh, free men, enslaved people, you know, taking them on, paying them equally. He, he was advocating at all, at all times <laughs> for the advancement of Black Americans through the war effort. Um, and, you know, stating that they had just as much at stake as white Americans and that they had to be included because they were Americans. They were part of America. They built America. They were part of the wealth uh, creation of America. So, so all of the wealth in the South, you know, Frederick Douglass was arguing was coming off of the backs of enslaved people. They were making America a reality. Um, so if anybody had stake as Americans, it was black Americans. And this was a, a delicate line for, for Lincoln because he came to realize uh, along with, you know, the, the agitation of various abolitionist generals, philanthropists, uh, civilians, you know, he was constantly getting uh, advice from everybody because this was back in a time where presidents like Lincoln would still meet with people <laughs> on, on a week to week basis and hear from the public. It's a very different context than we're used to now. Um, so he, he definitely had to be dragged along to that, to that stance. And for him, I think the process of enabling it as a war measure under the powers that he had as commander in chief was the way that he could square, uh, this, this strategy, essentially a, a military tactic that he recognized had value. Um, and I think is best expressed perhaps by somebody like uh, Henry Halleck uh, to Grant in March 1863 by saying that every slave removed from the South is a white man taken from the battlefield for the Confederacy. And that was a consideration with the prisoner exchanges, many, many things. Um, so he had to be dragged along and it took a lot of agitation by radicals, by abolitionists. And it was really when the needs of the war kind of met these, these agitations by people uh, for years and years and years that he recognized that it had use as a war measure, but he was still going to, to limit it as much as possible. And I think one of the, um, 
most telling things that happened with Lincoln was that he expressed to Frederick Douglass the idea that perhaps they could institute a sort of underground railroad to get people out of the South and bring them into the North. So if the North wasn't successful, they could at least bring people out of the South through uh, kind of extra legal means, essentially, and free them that way. But that he wasn't ever going to encroach on power and legal power that he didn't feel he had mm -hmm. and that was continually infuriating for a lot of people um but that's that's the hard part of being president and being commander-in-chief and trying to square the needs of the people with the needs of the nation with the desires of the people with what has to happen in war um so i don't necessarily have a stance on <laughs> the morality of what lincoln's doing but i i understand his position so yeah yeah yeah, and I think that explains the aging that he experienced during the war. If you compare the photos of Lincoln at the beginning and the end, wow, you can see the burden that he was bearing. And um, so thank you for the answer. Um, question for Emmanuel. Um, so given that free black men in Virginia, you know, knew what was coming, they knew it was very likely at some point, the hand of the Confederate government or wh whichever authority is going to reach down and try and compel them to do this labor. Did many of them uh, flee Confederate territory to avoid that? Yeah, great question. Yes, people did leave. Qual quantifying how many people is challenging. I mean, we're, we're still estimating that a half million enslaved people uh, fled um, during the course of the war. So piecing out how many free people were fleeing is challenging, but uh, certainly one of the people that I found um, through, I mean, I didn't find, uh, Dr. Edna uh, Green found years ago now um, in Charles City County, uh, so free black woman who was living on a farm, she had children, one of them was a, a older son who was, you know, prime age to be forced into a Confederate military uh, use uh, to dig earthworks, and he did so until uh, he managed to get back home. He fled uh, and ended up going down into uh, Hampton Roads region, enlisted in a Union uh, U.S. Colored Troop Regiment, uh, fought, you know, during, during the Civil War, uh, and, and was discharged, just um, died in the sort of post-war years. But um, and that's a great example of somebody who did not want to go dig earthworks for the Confederacy, um, didn't want to be further harassed by the Confederacy, uh, yet made a challenging choice of leaving his, uh, you know, middle-aged mother at home with younger children that were his siblings uh, to go fight um, in a U.S. color troop unit. Um, so free Blacks are facing some of the same challenges that enslaved people are facing, and I uh, hope that we can find out more about the the flight of free blacks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And as as you say, it would be impossible, you know, to count them all uh, and and uh, recover every experience. But the more we can do, the better. Um, for David, now a question about the tremendous loss of horses and mules, specifically in the former Confederacy during the Civil War. Do you have a sense as to how, uh, how long it took for the population of horses and mules to recover from those losses during the war? Well, certainly, it probably wasn't until the 1890s. Um, because the, 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 the numbers that I was using there were based on the census of 1870. So 10 years after the war, uh, you're looking at for the South, uh, about 250,000 head down. Uh, and again, the, the post-war period was not a uh, prosperous period generally um, in the South. So replacing them numerically, uh, I think was, was difficult. And I, I don't have an exact date for it, but I, I would assume not until uh, the 1890s, um, at least. So, 
Yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, another one for Emmanuel. Uh, one of our attendees uh, says they've, they've heard that their great-great-grandfather from the Manchester area was a free black man impressed into service by the Confederacy during the Civil War. Um, do you have any suggestions for research resources that this person can look to to try and verify whether that was true and find out a little bit more about their ancestor? Yeah, uh, so free black people are a bit easier to research than enslaved people. In, in my own family's line, I have both. <laughs> um, and so I would say if, if you have any sense of name uh, to go to the uh, census for 1860 and 1850 and start looking uh, through the Chesterfield County, because Manchester is not in Richmond, uh, during uh, the Civil War era um, and in search that way. Uh, through in terms of trying to find out their sort of Confederate military service, um, there's a couple of different ways. Um, one is uh, another researcher, Renee Ingram, went to the National Archives, that place that we're all terribly missing right now, those of us who love to research <laughs> and um, it's closed due to COVID. Um, but at the Library of Virginia, which is recently reopened, she um, got a, another copy of these engineer records uh, from the National Archives that cover May 1864 until early 1865. Um, and his name may be listed there. That's how I am, found out my own sort of family history, <laughs> partially. And then um, the National Archives has recently, in the last year and a half or so, digitized what was referred to as the slave rolls or slave payrolls. But sometimes there are free black people that are caught up on these records as well. And they are digitized. Um, and I think my friend, Dr. Adam Dombey is here. He has a website. It makes it a little bit more easy to navigate than the National Archives search engine in terms of looking for the counties that people were coming from and where they were going. So Chesterfield County, let's say, has a list of people that are going to go to the Richmond defenses. Um, more often than not, they are enslaved people, but sometimes you luck out and find uh, free black people. Great. Thank you very much. That's really useful. Um, so just, just a few minutes left, and I want to ask a question, the same question of each of you, which is how critical do you think the resource that you talked about was in thinking about the outcome of the war? And anyone can jump in. Mine's most important. <laughs> I beg to differ. <laughs> They're all equally important. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll start off with saying that, um, yeah, I think, I think the implementation of striking at the interior of the Confederacy, the Confederacy's failure to recognize that in the past, uh, you know, foreign enemies had made use of the enslaved population, essentially, and en enslaved people making use of foreign enemies as well. You know, this is this is a dual process. It's not one or the other. Um, I think they maybe, you know, in overcorrecting towards upholding a white supremacist enslaving nation that was dedicated solely towards the process of maintaining complete authority was too rigid. And uh, I think that that had significant ramifications because had they been able to make concessions to enslaved people, had they been able to uh, maybe emancipate men who would have um, signed up and em emancipated their families, that is something that was advocated in several arenas saying, you know, if we give them incentives to fight for the Confederacy, they will fight for the Confederacy. They'll defend their homes, they'll defend their families, their self-interest, their communities. If we give them a reason, to. Um, 
And I think the failure to do that was definitely significant. And I think that was one of many fatal errors that the Confederacy made that it didn't recognize. Um, you know, one of many, <laughs> obviously. And there are so many happy accidents and unforeseen things that happened during the war that could have completely changed the whole trajectory. So I, I can't say for sure that one was the <laughs> driving factor. Yeah. But um, I think that, yeah, recognizing that there are more than 1 million military-aged men within your ranks who could be willing to help if you gave them a reason to, uh, I think that's a massive failure and definitely a contribution, but one of many, many that happened and right. could have been avoided in many different ways, had several different things happened, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great, thank you. Uh, Emmanuel, David, do you wanna make a pitch? Well, I, I will just say that the Confederacy ran out of horses before they ran out of men. Great. No. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Simply put. Yeah. You kind of need those. <laughs> exactly. In the 19th century, you absolutely do. Uh, although one of the other interesting fun finds uh, in the archives was uh, suggestions for what was called a steam wagon, which was the precursor to the modern tank. <laughs> And Emmanuel, it's a slightly different question for you because, of course, you know, you're talking about coerced labor on behalf of the Confederacy, which lost the war. So I guess the question is, what difference did this coerced labor make to the Confederate war effort, if, if much of a difference? Uh, I would say that the coerced labor allowed the Confederacy to exist for four years. Uh, I mean, the firing upon Fort Sumter is April 1861. Um, the effort to force Black people, both free and enslaved, to um, participate starts in the spring of 1861 uh, and, and gets codified into law, uh, as I pointed out, in the summer of 1861, and it just continues and continues the demands upon free black people uh, to abandon their responsibilities at home to force them to uphold a slave holding a nation um, is, is really interesting. And, but it allowed Confederate military personnel, the white soldiers that are fighting um, to fight. There yeah. was more of them to shoot guns at US troops uh, if they didn't have to be somewhere else often far away from US troops um, to, to dig earthworks or work in hospitals. It would be impossible for Tredegar Ironworks to stay in function. Half of its labor force was black by, by 1863. Um, so, um, so yeah, so yep. it, it certainly helped the Confederacy last as long as it did. Yeah. I, th I think that's a really good way of putting it. Thank you. Um, well, unfortunately, we are out of time, uh, but I really want to thank our three presenters from this evening for getting the Civil War weekend events off to such a fantastic start. Really enjoyed your talks uh, and the conversation afterwards. Thank you for the, uh, to the attendees for the questions you gave to us, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us this evening. I really hope that you come back next week uh, for three more uh, great presentations on tangible resources, things like clothing and photographs, that kind of thing that uh, Americans used in the Civil War. Um, and when you log off from tonight's Zoom webinar, you should be directed to the registration page for next week's event. So again, even if you registered for tonight, you have to register again for next week and again for the week after that. So I hope you all keep coming back for more. We, we will certainly be glad to have you. And finally, I wanna thank my colleagues at the Virginia Tech uh, Continuing and Professional Education Unit who did such a wonderful job organizing this whole thing and handling the registration and making everything run smoothly with Zoom. So thank you, Leland Shelton and Caroline, Caroline Honeycutt. Um, good night, hopefully see you next week. Mm -hmm.